Hi everyone, I'm back again today. It's Toya here with another part of my testimony. This is part nine. Um, this is going to be about age 25. But first I'm going to start off with prayer and then jump right in. Our Heavenly Father, Yah, Yah of Abraham, Yah of Isaac, Yah of Jacob, Yah the Father, creator of all living things, Yah the Father of Jesus Christ, our King, our Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. I come to you today in the most humblest way, first of your precious Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, in order to speak to you in the proper order. Father, I just want to say thank you for this day and thank you for who you are. I want to say thank you for all that you do and all that you've brought me through. Father, I pray for your strength as I share this testimony. I pray for your grace as I get the words out as they come out of my mouth. Father, I pray for no distractions or interruptions, and I pray that those who need help hear this message, and that your word, as you say, will not come back void, Father, in the things that I share. Father, I want to say thank you. I honor you and I worship you today and every day. Hallelujah and amen. Okay, so I'm just going to dive right in. So part eight was talking about how I met my husband. Now, there was a video in between. Okay, part seven, the testimony was discussing my brother's death, um, two of my psych ward visits, and I want to just pick up from there because my husband and I, we kind of met again in between that year when I was going through those things. So I'm going to take it back so that you can understand the missing parts. And I do have my notes here with things jotted down so that I can remember as I go along. But I'm first I'm just gonna do much as that I can remember off top. So after my brother's death, I was devastated. Um, everything changed for me because like I was saying after my brother's death, that's when I went to the psych wards and the rape and everything. So coming back trying to, still trying to figure things out. I um, was in major depression and I was already diagnosed with bipolar. So that's, you know, highs and lows is already a form of depression as well. And the person I was with at the time, the lady I was with, cause I was married to a woman, um, she wasn't very supportive. She wasn't supportive of my brother's um, my brother being murdered and the things that I was going through and the rape and the psych ward. So I was just kind of dealing with all those things by myself. So that's why for a while I had started back like smoking weed and then I started back drinking. And some of the things that I had stopped doing after my brother's murder, I kind of started back doing those things again. And then I had lost my license for a year because of the DUI that I got. And I had just got my license back um, right before that last psych ward visit. So at this point, I wasn't getting support at home. I wanted to be outside of the house. I wanted to find friends. I wanted to find someone who could listen to me, someone who can maybe understand some of the pain that I was going through. Even though I didn't quite share the things I was going through, I just wanted an outlet. I wanted it to be um, freed from the things that was going on in my mind and the things that I was feeling and experiencing and facing. Now, the lady I was with, she wasn't really supportive. She didn't want to really go out with me. She didn't really want to do anything. She had completely changed from how she was when I first had met her. So I went onto the internet and I began to find friends or, you know, people that I can be around and get out of the house with. Um, I first met this, this lady on the internet and I started hanging out with her and her husband. And that's when I was introduced or I should say reintroduced to cocaine because I know back years before this girl had um, tried to ask me to do cocaine but I didn't want to do it but they had put a little bit on an ID and told me to just take a bump and I did but that was it that was never revisited again and I always felt like okay I shouldn't have done that but at this period of my life I was going through so much pain and I was going through so much suffering that I just didn't know what else to turn to and I had been doing I had done ecstasy before a lot you know in my teen years and in my um, adult life I had done a lot too so when I started hanging out with that couple 
when they were going to do drugs and stuff, I was asking them about like, okay, well, I'll get some ecstasy. Do you guys have that? And they were telling me like, oh, well, you know, cocaine is kind of like ecstasy. Um, they were just telling me how it was so similar. And if I can take ecstasy, they were saying it was worse. And they were saying then I could take cocaine. So I started dabbling into cocaine with them and like uh, prescription pills and things like that. So I spent time, you know, hanging out with them, doing things like that. Um, I didn't tell the lady that I was uh, with at the time. Um, she was actually in the military. And during that time, um, things just continued to get worse. Um, that's when I would come back to the house. And it, was, it seemed that she was upset because I was starting to get out the house. I was starting to, you know, um, get my independence back. I was driving again and I was gone a lot because I was sick of dealing with that depression and crying and sadness and loneliness, just all trapped in the house, you know, by myself. And, you know, I had been doing yoga, you know, back then I didn't know that yoga was wrong. So I was indulging in these type of things and I just wanted to get out. So um, at that time, the lady, she was telling me, well, I want a separation from you. I don't want to be with you anymore. So I told her, okay. Now, normally, like years ago, I would try to beg her. I would try to tell her she should change her mind. I would try to say, let's try to work things out. Let's try to make this work. Um, I would try to remind her of all the things that we have accomplished together and not to just give the relationship up so easy. I would try to tell her I would change whatever the issues or whatever the problems that she didn't like about me. See, I found myself always changing me, and that's how I believe that I lost myself because... When you get with a person who tells you that you're always wrong, that you're always the problem, that they're never wrong, when you get with a person like that, you can completely lose yourself because you're trying to change yourself to this person's standards, and this person's standards is unrealistic in the first place. So before I would be begging her, you know, please don't, I, you know, I realized that I had, um, like, codependent, I had, like, issues, like, depending on people and needing someone to be there because of my traumatic past I always wanted someone there so I would do that but it was like this time around I was fed up you know I was going through so much about my brother with the rape with the hospitalizations and the medications all those things that I was just like okay fine so we separated rooms you know we were staying in two separate rooms in that house and I was still continuing to have my independence I was going out with those friends I was partying again, I was drinking again, I was doing cocaine, and I started doing cocaine as a habit. So I, you know, was just like, whatever. So then, that's when she started to get angry because I wasn't begging her anymore. I wasn't calling her anymore, like trying to get her to, re to reason, and I was tired of doing that. I had gotten fed up. So then after that, it was like she stopped talking to me more, she would stay in the room more, and she would just kind of isolate me. Um, I'm sorry, isolate herself from me and wouldn't speak to me. And it was like I was kind of on my own. She was kind of her own. Now, usually we would file taxes together and I would get about a thousand. Um, I, I think she would give me like a thousand a bag or twelve hundred back or whatever it was. I had half and she had half. And it was like, it was just the beginning of the year. I think it was like February or March. And I was asking her like, okay, well, where's my half? Because she started to tell me that I don't want to be together anymore. And I told her, well, we can both live here still. I can work and then we can just kind of be roommates until we kind of both, um, I can get on my feet and then kind of go my way. And she was like, no, I don't want you living here. I don't want to be a roommate. You, I don't want you to be seeing other people while you're living here. And I'm telling her like, well, you don't want to be with me. And you're, you're telling me that it's over. So it shouldn't even matter to you. But she didn't want to give me the chance to get on my feet is what it seems. Because after... After that situation, she started telling me, well, I don't have any cut for you for your tax money. I didn't get, because I was going to school, so I would get um, the taxes for me going to college. And she was saying, well, you didn't get anything. I, I can't give you anything this time. I got so much things to pay for. And she was very secretive about the bills and wouldn't let me be involved in what she was paying for or where the money was going. Like, she wouldn't let me see. So then after, shortly after that, she tells me, well, I want you out. And we were living in Georgia. Um, I'm originally from Chicago and I went to, you know, I lived in Hawaii as well throughout high school, but I was living in Georgia. I didn't have any family or anything in Georgia. So she was 
gave me this piece of paper that she had filled out and formally signed and everything and was saying that I want a separation and you have 30 days to get out of here. And I was trying to reason with her and tell her that I didn't have anywhere to go and I need more time than that and you're not giving me any money so I don't really have anything to go off of. And I didn't want to call my mom. My mom's in Hawaii and I was trying my best to, I didn't want everyone to know that this relationship was actually horrible and killing me. So I was trying to keep things to myself. So I did all that I could. I started applying for work everywhere. Um, I had already had a degree. I had had associate's degree in, um, already. So I was applying for work everywhere. And I was still hanging out with that couple. So what happened was she started to, um, she was starting to lock me out the house because I was hanging out with them. She was starting to tell me that, uh, trying to put stipulations on you, making things harder for me. Like you're telling me you don't want me here, but then now you're locking me out the house because I don't want to be around you because you said we're not together. And then you're making it hard for me when I'm going to look for work because I have to worry about am I going to be able to get back in the house later if I go somewhere else later. Just all those things. And I had keys, but she would lock like an additional door or the back door didn't have keys. I didn't have keys to that. She would lock things like that so that I couldn't get in. So eventually I was still on the internet looking for what I was going to do. And then that's when I I went on this site. Um, it was called Backpage. I don't I forget where I hear about it from, but I heard about it from somewhere. And I went on this page and I found this girl on here, and she was saying that she was um, I mean she was working as a prostitute and uh, selling her body to get money. So I knew from my past how I used to hang out and run with pimps and stuff. If you watch my old, um, test my previous testimonies, I knew that, um, that people have pimps. So I was looking for someone who didn't have a pimp because I said, I'm not going to have a pimp. I refuse, you know, I'm not going to be doing this work and give my money to anybody and no one's going to be putting their hands on me. I will never let somebody put their hands on me again is what I was, you know, thinking. So I wrote, I think I wrote one person, but she had a pimp, and I was like, that's a no-go. So I wrote this girl. She said she didn't have a pimp. It was just her and another girl, and they were by themselves. So I wrote her, and she was telling me that I could um, come over there and meet her and hang out with them. So like I said, it was it was after me looking for jobs, and she stressing me every day, when are you leaving? Your time is running out. Sign this paper. You have to get out of here. Like, she's pushing me and pushing me and pushing me and I felt like my back was against the wall so I went and go meet these girls and oh, I, and I want to say too that the reason why I felt like this was already too easy was because what I said in my previous testimony that when she was saying we were saying we wanted to have a kid or have a baby that I had uh, for that period of time agreed to like sleep with these men to try to have a baby. So for me, I was already screwed up in my mind and in my head for even doing that. So it kind of opened up a doorway for me to be able to say, okay, well this should be easy because I've already opened that doorway to doing that, but this time they'll be paying me for it. So I believe that's what made my mind feel that, well, I've already done this, so this time I'm gonna be getting paid for it. So I went there and met the girls and um, I immediately clicked with one of them. She was like such loving heart, so kind. I just felt her spirit. And she, everyone has a story. That's why you can't judge someone that lifestyle unless you know them or their story. So she didn't even want to be in the lifestyle. What happened was her and her boyfriend was traveling. They're also from the Midwest and they were traveling. They were down there and the cops arrested him. And she started doing the lifestyle because she was stranded out there. And she, didn't want to, she wanted to help put money on his books and wait for him while he was in jail. So that's how she got into it. And that's why she didn't have a pimp or anything because she was just trying to save enough money to put on his books and wait for him until he got out, until he got his court date. So when I was talking to her, I'm like, okay. And then for me, I'm in this situation because all these things that keeps happening to me. And then after the rape, I felt useless. I felt like I'm, I'm tired of being raped. You know, in my life, I'm tired of feeling like nothing. I'm tired of feeling worthless. Obviously, I must be nothing, right? You know, people rape me. 
all this trauma I'm going through, all these things happening to me back to back, I started to feel like, well, I'm useless anyways. I'm nothing anyway, so it wouldn't even matter. And also, I'm in this rock and hard place where my back's against the wall and I'm being told, I don't care where you go. I don't care what you do. Figure it out. You can't stay here. I'm not giving you your money that was yours. I'm not giving you anything. You just got to figure it out. So what do I do? I figure it out. So I start hanging out with her, and uh, immediately um, I began the life of prostitution. I began the life of prostitution. Um, I was living out of a hotel with the girl, we'll just call her Coco. And back in those days, they used to call me Tink. So me and Coco were living together. Um, there was another girl at first, but then she was trying to really grind me and shice so we got away from her. She was a thief. She was like trying to steal money and she would lie about it and stuff. So we got rid of her, got away from her. So it was just me and Coco. And the thing about it was that we would work enough to have enough money for our hotel rooms every night. And people, whether they know it or not, it's expensive to live in a hotel because you can be paying $60, $70 for just one night. And if you're staying in a hotel for like a month, you're paying... You could be paying thirteen hundred or more just to stay there, and it's more because you still have to pay for your own food. You still have to pay for your own everything, you know, pretty much. So we would make enough to make sure we had enough for our cocaine. Well, I'll say our room first, our cocaine, our alcohol, our food, and clothes. So that's we would work like this daily to make sure we had those needs met. Because when I used to try this at the time when I was still trying to go back home with the lady that I was with, like I said, she was locking me out and she was basically saying, when are you getting out every day, every day. So I moved in with uh, Coco. So we were doing that to survive daily. Now, what I didn't, what I will say is. The way how the Most High gets his glory and everything is that he kept us safe. And it's not condoning the lifestyle. It's just saying that when you're one of his children, he'll have his hands over you when you're in your sin. He wants you out of your sin, but he will protect you. And I say that because we could have been killed. You know, I remember that first, the first week, that first night that I had started this. At first, there was another girl there and she had a boyfriend. And they would just like sit in the bathroom. I guess they say that they were for protection in case somebody did something. And I remember working that first day and I made about like a thousand dollars or something like that, around a thousand dollars. And I remember in my spirit, I remember looking at the guy and he just looked so sinister. Like I can see how evil he looked. And something kept telling me, don't stay here, like go, like don't stay here. I kept feeling like he was going to rob me or do something. So that first night, I was like, okay, well, I can't stay here. You know, I felt something eerie about him. So I went to my car, took my money, went to my car. So after that, I was just like, okay. But he was gone because the next day when I came over there, they tried to lie and accuse me and said that I had stole money from Coco. And Coco said, no, you guys are lying because this isn't the first time this has happened, that my money has come up. And she, I just met her. She wasn't even around. So she left them and me and her went to another hotel together. So I just wanted to put that in because sometimes I wonder what I went through so much and why do I go through so much? I have to remember that he didn't let me get killed. He didn't let me get like robbed or raped or any diseases, no AIDS, no STDs or just anything like that. So I have to remember that and that just came to my spirit. So I remember when we were in that lifestyle, the thing that I don't talk about, I'll tell people that I used to be a prostitute when I was in that lifestyle, but I don't tell people how desperate one has to be to get into that lifestyle. Now, I know you're going to say some girls, they quiet, they take pictures, they put it on Instagram, Facebook, MySpace, back then, MySpace, Backpage, uh, Craigslist, wherever. And you may feel like they're glorifying it, but from being in that situation, you have to be completely desperate to go into the lifestyle of prostitution. Because when we were in that lifestyle, 
it was completely stressful. Like you just, you never know who you're going to get because a lot of times you didn't see a picture. I mean, there was times that you could, but most times you couldn't see a picture. It was just like, okay, this is the location and they just show up. So you have no idea who's going to show up, who's going to be behind that door. If that guy's going to have a weapon, if that guy's going to have more guys with him, because if he has more guys with him, he can come in there, they can rape you, they can take your money, whatever, kill you. So it's stressful, you don't know. And that's the thing, like, I didn't think about all these things in depth back then because I was more so just focused on getting enough money to have for those, for each night, each day, for us to continue to survive. So I tried to block those things out, but I did. Funny enough, I was still praying. I was still praying. And when you're in that lifestyle, like I said, a lot of things can happen to you. Um, I've, you know, I've just basically, you have to worry about cops. You know, cops come undercover and they can come in there and they can arrest you. And I remember thinking that that would have been the most shameful thing ever because I was lying. I was keeping it a secret. I wasn't telling anybody. And I remember thinking, like, if I get arrested in this lifestyle, everybody's going to know this is going to be the most embarrassing thing that I could have ever went through. So it's like that you don't know if you're going to get somebody who's, like, aggressive and, and you know, doing aggressive things to you and requesting aggressive things of you. It's very a very fearful lifestyle to be in and then at the same time what kept us going was that we knew we had to pay for that hotel we knew we had needed food and then us doing the cocaine and alcohol was our way of probably numbing ourselves and surviving like we would do it sometimes like after after everything was over or we might do a little cocaine before just to give us just to get us up enough to even be able to mentally get through this because we both hated it neither one of us liked it neither one of us glorified it I mean we we hated that we were even bowing down to doing such things but we love being together her and I you know we created a bond very close bond um she had been through a lot of trauma just as I had so I can say that I I do feel blessed to have met her to have shared spent time with her but um it was just a lot of traveling I mean, we, we traveled, well, we traveled to like a different state, but I mean, even before then, we were like always traveling to different hotels because that's another thing. You don't want to stay at the same hotel too long because you don't want somebody coming back, like double back and coming to your room, knowing you're there, knowing who's there. And then what we would do is we would just hide in the bathroom, one or the other. So if she had somebody coming to a date with her, I would just hide in the bathroom and I would just listen to make sure she was okay. And then I had like a timer because it, you know, went by time. You pay for time. And I would, if they wouldn't leave, you know, I would come out the room or either I would bam on the door. Just something letting them know someone else is here, so don't try it. And she would do the same thing for me. So it was definitely nowhere to live, no way to live. Um... I have been in a situation before where, I mean, you have to really stand your grounds and be tough in these situations because you have people that are like really disgusting and, and that will try to ask you to do things and do things without protection. I was in a lifestyle, you tell them no way, I'm not, you You have to always tell them no way and I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. You know, they can threaten you, they can curse you out, just such things like that. So it was, it was no way you know, for anybody to live. And um, I thank God that it was just like, um, one day I got this phone call um, after having a customer that I refused to do services with because this customer wanted to do services without protection. And I told him, no, that's a no-go. In fact, when people used to call us and ask for things like that, Coco used to curse them out and call them disgusting and say, don't ever call this phone again. But this person tried it while they were there. But they, the thing about it is we always took the money first. So nothing happens and nothing goes on until the money is handed in the hand first. So I had already had the money. And the guy, when he was trying to get services um, without protection, and I told him, no way. He wanted his money back. And I'm like, no, you're not getting your money back because you don't start a service and then think you're going to get money back because, you know, 
it didn't go, you wanted something that wasn't going to occur. So I remember after that, you know, he just said some things to me and then left. But it was shortly after that, um, I don't know if it was the same days. I was always feeling convicted about the lifestyle. I had a friend who was telling me that she didn't like me in the lifestyle. So I started thinking like, okay, well, I'll become a stripper. At least being a stripper, I don't have to worry about the police. I don't have to worry about being in these close, um, these these places where I'm behind closed doors with these men. And what we were thinking about doing like private parties and different things like that. Like, you know, but I was thinking like, okay, well, at least it's legal for me to be a stripper and I can get the money and don't have to worry about being in these close corners like this. So I started thinking about those things when my when one of the girls I knew was saying that she didn't like that life for me. And I was feeling convicted about it myself. I knew it wasn't right. I knew I'd always said that I wouldn't have been in a lifestyle like that. So I was trying to find a way too. And I'm still I still had jobs and things that I was applying for. I went on interviews and I knew that I was being blocked. I knew it had to be the devil or the most high wanting me to move or just something because I applied for something as simple as Chili's, like just to be a waitress. And I had a degree and I had an interview and she liked me. I didn't even get that job. So it's like I was trying everything that I could and I kept feeling like a foot was just on my neck. So I had got a phone call at the hotel one day. Well, the, um, someone called me. They had like a different accent and they used my, um, one of my street names at the time. And they asked to speak to me, the name that I told the guy. I don't know if it was Tink. It might have been Tink or Aloha Breezy. It might have been Breezy. So he asked to speak to me, and I'm just like, yeah. And I remember him saying that they were calling the cops on me, um, or they had done an investigation, were doing an investigation on me, and the cops were going to come arrest me because they knew that I was um, prostituting. And... The girls kept trying to tell me that the call was a prank call because the guy was mad that I didn't give him his money back or didn't do those services without protection. But for me, it was enough. Like, I felt like that phone call, whether it was a prank or whomever it was, I felt like that phone call snapped me into reality that I could actually be in jail serving time for this crime. And I was just like, no, you know, and that's when I started saying, well, I'll just do be a stripper. And I actually even went on like an interview and everything. Well, I, I went to a club and I was dancing and they wanted to hire me there because I was just like, I, I can't, I can't stand this lifestyle. And then I remember when I was in the lifestyle, the lady I was with at the time, my wife, she called me and she was telling me that God told her that I needed to pray because something was going to happen to me. And at the time, I was in the hotel, and I believe I was in another state. I was in South Carolina. We had left Georgia. We were going to work out there, too. So she had called me on the phone, and I got into the shower, and I started praying. And back then, I didn't know crosses was bad, so I was still wearing a cross and everything. And I got in there, and I started praying. So I do remember that, and that was just one of the stories. Um, I do remember my friend Coco having a guy or two that would, would they would try to stay past the time or be a little bit aggressive and just things like that. So I, I do remember things like that. Um, a lot of it's a blur. I just know it was a lot, it was a lot of partying, a lot of drinking. Um, I do remember that um, that's why I put in my uh, testimony series topics when I said adultery. I didn't commit adultery in my marriage or anything like that. This was adultery committed before I was married because in that lifestyle, I've I've had to um, I've worked with couples before, uh, married couples before have hired me to do services, so I had to repent of that. Um, because adultery, if fornication is already is a very it's a huge sin. All of it's a huge sins, and so is adultery. So I have repented of that. Um, it's a really dark dark lifestyle. It's really just like sex, drugs, and alcohol. Um, none of it made me feel better. Um, I guess I was just suppressing everything that I had been through and it didn't make me feel better. So that's just the brief briefness of that lifestyle. Um, I thank the Most High God that it was short-lived. Um, I don't know if it was, if I was in there for like three months. Um, 
but again, every single day was about making that quota. And it wasn't to give our money to a man, but it was to for us to survive. So that's what made it more troubling for me because there are some people out here who do these things because they think it's fun, they want they want attention, they want to be popular. But for us, it was about survival. When is our what is our next meal? When is our our shelter? Where we're gonna live? And I think that, you know, I thank God for getting me out of that. And I wish I could tell y'all that this is all that happened, but it wasn't. So I had met, um, I met another girl while I was in this lifestyle, but she didn't know because she lived in South Carolina. We were in Georgia at the time. When I went to South Carolina, it was just a vacation, a little visit, a little vacation. And we were working, we went there to work. So I met this girl on the internet as well. And me and her were talking, like in the sense of like trying to date, get to know each other. And she was living in South Carolina and the lady, the people that she was living with, they were going to kick her out. So we and the girls, when I, we were deciding, you know what, I'm not going to do this lifestyle anymore. It's not right. And I was saying, I'll just, maybe I'll be a stripper. Then after that, I was like, okay, well, you know, maybe we should just try again and just keep applying for jobs. And then everybody started to, uh, the other girls would started to agree and she got like a hotel job. I, I applied for all those. I still wasn't getting called back, but I still had money saved up. So we ended up going to get, our, going to get a trailer. I got a trailer, put in my name and everything. And I was happy that, you know, the money, some of the money we saved up, we actually got us a place because instead of spending it at the hotel all the time. But originally we were going to get that trailer to work out of because we felt like it was cheaper than paying for the hotel rent. But then, you know, something my spirit was saying, which I now know is the Holy Spirit, we shouldn't do it at all. So we got out of the lifestyle, got the trailer, and then she was working at the hotel, like cleaning instead of, you know, prostitution. And I was still looking for jobs. So the girl that I was talking to, she said they kicked her out. So we was like, okay, well, we'll move her in with us in Georgia because we know what it's like to not have anywhere to go. And plus, that was like my little girlfriend at the time, whatever. So she came out there with us and... She didn't know that I was in the lifestyle, but when she found out about it, I mean, found out about me doing drugs and things like that, she would tell me not to do it. And she was also uh, bipolar, too. So we were cool. We were all hanging out. Everything was fine. So then after I got the trailer, it was like the wife that I was with. Then she started, you know, trying to call me again because I had moved out, like, officially. Like, at first I was just locked out and she didn't want me around, but now... It was like I went and got a mover's truck and got all of my things at her house. See, I had furniture there because my brother, the one in the video I just said was murdered, my only sibling. He had, he had, his furniture was so new. He was killed so briefly, so swiftly, excuse me, that his new furniture was still in the boxes. So my mother gave me all of my brother's new furniture and I had his furniture. We had, me and the lady had already had furniture together. We were in Hawaii that my mom left. So the one in Georgia was like, my brother was killed in Atlanta. So he lived in Atlanta and we lived in Hinesville, which is four hours away. So we got a mover truck and took all his furniture there to the house with her and I, plus the other furniture. So it was like two sets of furniture in that house, basically. So I took my set, which is my brother's, all my clothes. And I took all my brother's um, things because I still had his clothes and shoes and his things that we took from, the, um, from Atlanta and brought in the moving truck. So I took all those things and moved in to the trailer. And once I got there, it was like, I don't know if I was there for a week or two, but then my wife, she started calling. Oh, you should get back with me. Oh, we should try again. And she would tell me, you know, we were together for um, three years and you were only with this new girl for three months and you should you know, give me a chance. All these things that was trying to pull on my heartstrings because I was a good person and I, you know, felt like, well, maybe she would change. So she asked me to come over there to the house and just to talk to her. So the other girl didn't want me to go, but I was telling her, well, you know, it is my wife, you know, I'll go. So I went over there to the house with, um, who was my wife at the time, and I stayed over there for like a night. I think I stayed the night and I stayed like during that day for the next day or I went during the day and I stayed a night or something like that because I feel like I came back the very next morning or like a day and a half so when I came back the other girl had been texting me the whole time like oh you know be with her this and that all this stuff so when I came back um 
when I came back the next morning, or it could have been the, the it, it either was one night or two nights. I thought it was one, but it could have been two. When I came back to the trailer, all of my stuff was gone. All of my brother's stuff was gone. The only thing that was left in there was like miscellaneous things. Like it looked like it was just ramshack. Like it was like little pieces of clothes here and there. My brother's stuff was in totes, all brand new. My brother back then was like so, he was so into designer. So Jordan this, Nike this, he had all that stuff. All that stuff was taken. His his like skates was left there. I had like two, two a pair of shoes just scattered out. Everything was trash. Like all like the dining room table was gone the couches was gone just everything that i owned and it was literally just that was like it was just gone and then there was a little girl there who i had met that was friends with the girl that i was that i had let live with us which we'll call her m so we let m live with us and the m this is m's little uh god sister she told us that she opened up the door and she told them that anybody who want this stuff that they can just have it, they're free to just take it. So after that, you can only imagine how upset and devastated I was to walk into my trailer and everything that I had saved the money for and everything I had done, my commitment to getting out of this lifestyle, staying out of this lifestyle, doing better for my life, and to come in there and see the entire place robbed, trashed, and everything to my name is completely gone. I want to say I lost it. My medication, I wasn't taking my medication anyways during the time that I was running the streets, but it was still belonged to me in case I want, wanted it to sleep or anything. All that gone. Called the police because I wanted to make a police report and let them know what was going on. So I called the police and I let them know about what's going on in regards to me being robbed. So I called the police and the little girl that was there was telling me where all of my things were. She was showing me the trailers around and saying, your stuff's in here, your stuff's in there. And you can even see by one of the people's houses, they had a couch by the trash can because like I said, my brother's couch was brand new. So I guess they threw their couch out and took my brother's couch. So I'm telling the officer, listen to her. She's saying my things are here, my things are there. Calling the police was the worst thing that I probably could have ever done. So the cop is not checking. He's not knocking the doors. He's not checking the house. He's telling me there's nothing I can do about it. It's upsetting me. I'm telling him the girl who did it. I'm telling her her name, first and last. I'm telling her where she lives. Because she, when she first came down there, she had like some um, uh, in a godly godparents or whatever who lived down the street. So she was spending a lot of time with them. That's how I used to hang out with her over there before she moved in. So I spent time with her over there. So they live down the street. So I'm telling them she's there. I'm telling them her name. I'm telling them everything they need to know. They're not trying to help me. They're not cooperating. It's like this time in my life, like the devil was working so hard against me. And it was like, you can just clearly see it. So I'm telling him, my stuff is down there. Are you gonna go get it? You know, I'm, I'm you know, I got so upset. He kept saying, I can't do anything. I can't help you. And next thing I just blurted out, I'm going to kill her. I just screamed it out, I'm going to kill her. And he was like, wait, why did you do that? I got a body cam on, now they heard you and it's been recorded and now there's nothing I can do. I gotta take you to jail. Um, that's a terroristic threat. And I'm just like, okay. I mean, I was so done, I was so devastated. All the things I had been through, like, you know, with my brother, for my brother's things to be taken like that. I was saving those things. My brother has three sons. I was saving those clothes and shoes to give to his sons and to give some of this stuff to my father. And to take that from me, I, I mean, I it wasn't my clothes. Yeah, I cared a little bit, but not the way I cared about my brother's things, you know. And I had had his things for, at this time, it wasn't even a year yet. So I was just devastated by that. And he said, well, you're going to have to go to jail because I got this recorded and the lady was like can we give her disorderly conduct and she's like he was like no I can't because it's recorded on here so fine so I get in the car well he handcuffs me I get in the car takes me to jail I get to the jail and once I get to the jail he's telling me that he has to do this paperwork so I can get first appearance so he's he's doing paperwork he said you never really been in much trouble before have you and I was just like no 
I was just done. I felt numb. I didn't want to talk. I was upset. I just felt like it doesn't even matter. Maybe I do need to be in jail. Maybe that'll keep me, it'll keep, make sure I don't go back to the streets. I'll stay out of life prostitution. I'll, I'll stay away from the wife who men me know well. I'll be away from this girl who I want to kill. Maybe I do need to go to jail. Maybe I do need to get some things in order. Because my life was just spiraling out of control and I was just in so much pain. So my mindset the whole time was getting ready to go to jail and do some time because that's probably what I needed. So I was just sitting there and processing everything. So when I got to the, um, after you did the paperwork, it took me to uh, another part of the station. They processed me, fingerprints, picture, mugshot, all that. Uh, I changed my outfit, all that. And... Uh, changed my shoes and they sent me into a holding cell so while I was in the holding cell it was cold <laughs> that's what I remember because I was laying on the thing and I remember them because it was this was early in the morning I had got to the trailer at like seven or eight in the morning so because I was planning to go there because my wife had convinced me oh come back you know just just close the trailer up we can we can fix this come stay with me so I was going back to the trailer so when I was in the jail, it probably was like 9 in the morning by the time I got there, processed in and everything, 9 or 10. So I remember the man knocking on the door, asked me if I wanted some food, and I said yes because I didn't know how long I was going to be there. I didn't know if I was going to stay, you know, be in, go to jail, like be locked up. So I was like, yes, you know, I ate the food and everything. And this is one of the most devastating parts. After that, it was like, it was time for me to go first appearance to see the, the judge. So they told me it's time to go see the judge. So they put my cuffs back on me and they actually put shackles on my feet because of what my, um, because of what my uh, charge was. So I have shackles on my feet. I'm walking down the hall. I'm completely embarrassed. I have my head down because I can see before I looked. It was like a glass right there. You can see the guys in the glass. I seen a couple guys standing there looking, and the glass is on each side, and I'm walking in that hallway, like in the middle. So I just kept my head down. I was so embarrassed with those shackles on my feet. I was walking. You can hear all that noise, the click, click, and then just it was hard to move my feet, so I was just like, okay, kept my head down. I got inside of the um, with the judge, and sat down in the chair and he was harsh with me. It was a white man, white judge. And he was, he. but the officer who arrested me actually was a black officer. But when he arrested me, he was saying that since it was recorded, he had a body count, he had to take me in. But when he got into the station, he was nice to me. He rushed the paperwork and he kept telling me, he knew I didn't really get into trouble before. He was very kind with me. But the white judge, he dealt harshly with me. And he was kind of talking aggressive with me, a little, little harsh. So he asked me, he said, do you know what your charge is? And then I kind of told him, yeah. He said, a terrorist. And he says, yeah. And he was like, well, do you want a judge? I mean, do you want a lawyer? And I was like, no. You know me, I didn't think it was that serious. So I was like, no. He was like, what do you mean, no? He's like, this is a serious offense. And he was like, you need to make sure you have a lawyer. This is very serious. This is a felony. And I was just like, okay. So... I'm thinking in my mind, how am I going to afford a lawyer? But he's telling me to sign these papers and make sure that I don't come in contact with the girl M. If I come in contact with her, I'm going to go straight to jail. If I see her and her family, I'm to walk the other way and all this stuff. And I have to sign these papers saying that. And I had a, um, he, he let me get a bond for, um, I think it was 1200 He let me get a bond. And I had called my wife at the time and told her my bond and all that stuff. She was not answering the phone. Like I called her. Good thing it wasn't like on TV where you only get one call because I called her like four or five times. She wouldn't answer the phone. So I had to call my mom in Hawaii and ask her to tell her to pick up the phone because I'm calling. And then when I call my mom, she goes, make me feel worse, of course. Oh, what are you doing? I always told you your mouth was going to get you in trouble. Oh, why would you say that? I mean, just nagging me while I'm on the phone in jail. And I'm just like, can you just tell her to answer the phone? I already feel like crap. Thank you. Thank you for making me feel worse than what I already do. Thank you. So I uh, finally get her on the phone. I give her the number for a bondsmith. And then I get bonded out. But I had to, once I got bonded out, I had to call them 
and let them know when I was leaving the state or when I was leaving the city and all these things like that, and leaving on the voice recorder and all that stuff. And they were to give me a court date because they hadn't given me a court date yet. So in the meantime, I was just looking for a lawyer and trying to find something I can afford. And because we were married, um, and I know I keep saying married, but I know according to God, two women can never get married, two men can never get married. So I have never been married until now with my husband. I'm just, for the sake of the story, see, I can follow what I'm saying and see how deep in sin I was that I thought I was married to a woman and actually let someone do that, um, stand before a judge to, to do that. That's how messed up my life was. So since she was in the military, they were saying that she made too much money for me to get a public defender. So I would have to get a lawyer, like pay for somebody. So we were trying to figure out those things. And it was just so devastating. Like, you know, I just couldn't believe that after my brother passed, I, I'm trying to find myself that I'm going to the hospital and I'm trying to get better than the rape happens. And then I, it's like I just kept going backwards when I got into the lifestyle and said, I'm going to do better. This happens. So then after that, that's where the video comes in, the one I made, part eight, with how I met my husband, because I had gotten out of the lifestyle, moved back in with my wife, and but she started back how she was before, cold shoulder, isolating me, the same things that she had been done. So I hadn't seen my friends in a while, and I was just trying to build my best behavior, hoping that if I changed myself, that she would change. So then that's when that story came in when she was saying that, well, we're going to go to Chicago because she was going to go out of town um, in a couple of months to go back for military work. So she goes, we're going to go to Chicago so you can see your dad. And then that's when in that video explains about the Chicago trip and how I met my husband. So I met my husband in the midst of all the pain and suffering that I was going through. I not met him. I had already met him two years before that, but I mean, actually had a conversation and spent time with him and saw him. I didn't really see him at the funeral because I was in so much agony. I didn't really spend time with him at the funeral or anything. So after the robbery, I went into major depression and I guess I can finally look at these notes. Um, yes, I was suicidal. I was suicidal. So after... Uh, spending that time with my husband in Chicago, I went back to Georgia. So I was back depressed, back isolated, back lonely, back suffering, and I became suicidal. And I had posted a picture on the internet with a woman like this. And I was saying that, without saying that I was gonna kill myself. And that's when my husband wrote me and said, if you need me, I'm here. So, I was going and dealing with that. Each day I was stressed out because I was worried about this terroristic threat. I was seeing that you, how many years in jail you can get, like five more years in jail for that. It's a felony. And it was a lot. So after that, um, that was July when I had seen my husband, came back to Georgia. So I was in Georgia for August. And I think, no, nah, for the rest of July and I think a little bit of August and then she had to go away from the military so she was going to either, I was either going to go back to Chicago or um, she asked if I wanted to stay with her mom while she was gone. I didn't want to. I wanted my home space and you know, she asked if I wanted to go back with my mom, you know, to Hawaii while she was gone. So I figured I'd just go back to that lifestyle again, partying, hanging out with friends and just doing drugs, whatever, it didn't even matter to me. So I said, yes, you know, I'll go back to Hawaii. So I had went back to Hawaii. Yeah, okay, I'm caught up on my notes. I have remembered, okay. So I had went back to Hawaii and it's, I, it's, it seemed like as soon as I got off the plane, you know, that's when my wife started acting funny again. She had already started back to her old ways, but she was still saying, oh, we're gonna be together, this and that. And right before, the night before I left, I went to hang out with my friends who were doing drugs, getting high and stuff. But I remember coming when I had got to Hawaii, like that first week she was already acting funny. Like she was barely messaging me, she was barely checking on me. And I was just thinking like, well, what's the problem? You know, she begged me to come back home. I left my trailer and you see what happened once I left my trailer. and. I 
I uh, the people was mad at me that I had broke the lease, like all this stuff because she begged me to come back. So when I got to Hawaii and she was still in Georgia, I'm like, okay, she's acting kind of funny. She's not really messaging me. What's the problem? So she was just kind of like, oh, you know, and I'm like, do you not want to be together? Like, what, is that the reason why you're acting funny? And she kind of was just like, oh, you know, well, I don't know. Just kind of playing games, like trying to string me along. And before I left to Hawaii, I had packed. I had got some more clothes. She helped me get some clothes and I had some things still left there. And I had clothes, I had took like, I think one or two suitcases with me to Hawaii. And that's all I had. Like everything else was stolen, everything else was gone. So I had my stuff there and um, she was acting funny towards me. So I'm like, okay, well, did you not like, what's the problem? So then she eventually tells me, I don't want to be with you. I want a divorce. My car was still there. She goes, I'll ship your car to you. And I still had clothes there. She's like, and whatever is left, I'll just ship it to you. Like, I, my paperwork was still there. Like, you know, my birth certificate, my degrees, and things like that. So, I'm certificates, and I'm just like, well, I need that stuff. So, she lets me know. So, basically, I was homeless. I was just supposed to be visiting my mom for like a month or two. But now she's like, okay, you can't come back. So, here's your car. Here's your clothes. Figure it out. I'm sorry. That just made me mad. It made me mad because I had worked so hard. The things I had to go through, the things I had to do, the things I had to suffer from, the things I had to endure for me to save up that money to get that trailer on my own. I know it wasn't good money. But I do know that I, I earned it and I got my place and I left that lifestyle like I promised myself that I would. So to work that hard and to do all of that and for somebody to make me leave that and make give me promises of we don't have to, you know, we're going to have this great life or we're going to go back to how we were. And then send me across the world and say, ha, 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 you're homeless. I got you. Demonic, evil, wicked. So now I'm homeless. And I never want to live with my mom because I was always homeless when I lived with my mom. I was always kicked out or put out or something had always happened to me when I lived with my mom because, I mean, the people that she was with. So now I'm homeless. I don't want to live there. That's why when I first had these problems, I didn't call my mom because I didn't want to live with my mom. And I knew that that's what she would have suggested. And I had rather sell my body and live on the streets and live in the hotels than live with my mom and go through that. Just to have my peace of mind. Because when I wasn't working, me and Coco, we had a peace of mind. And that's what I had preferred to do than live with her. So now I'm homeless in Hawaii after I've left that lifestyle and thought that I would get my life back together. So that was what happened. So all this stuff is weighing on my mind, weighing on my mind, weighing on my mind. So then when I start talking to my husband again, this is after we met, you know, because we had met again at that um, picnic but now we're coming down to like October now we're in October so I have been homeless there for a couple of months I'm spiraling out of control I'm still doing drugs drinking partying everything then it was just like one day I just was just it's like I was just crying out to the most high I started writing in my journal I started talking to him a lot because I just didn't know where to turn. I had always prayed and talked to God, but it was just like, this is just too heavy. It's too much. I just can't deal with it anymore. And, you know, I had, you know, reached out and, um, I was writing my diary all the time. And that's when the most high was pulling me away from homosexuality, letting me know that people in that lifestyle are going to burn in hell and pulling me from that, taking the desires away from me and just taking it from me. Like I wasn't desiring anymore. It wasn't attracting me anymore. It was making me feel how he felt about it, that it wasn't of him and it was disgusting and it wasn't, it didn't come from him. So I was pulled away from that and I started, I reached out, you know, I reached out to my husband and I was talking to him and I was having a lot of problems, you know, at my mom's because it's like the most high was pulling me apart. He was pulling me away from the like, after I was doing all that partying and drinking and trying to, you know, I was still doing things and, um, you know, encounter like with another married couple, just different things like that. So I still was doing things like that. 
And it was like God was pulling me away. I had stopped doing that. Then I took a break from the partying, the drinking, the smoking. Um, I had my hair dyed, so I had cut it off because I wanted to get the dye out of my hair. It started over. I was being more natural. I was working out, taking care of myself, like all the things that Most High wants from us. So I was doing that, and I was doing great. But then it's like Satan was using my mom, and my mom is actually in a homosexual relationship. So my mom's girlfriend, he was using them to bring me down. So they were saying things to me like, oh, why are you wearing your natural hair? Your natural hair doesn't look nice. You need to put weave in it. You need to put color in it. Oh, you should wear makeup. Oh, come back to the club with us. You know, you need to show your body. Why are you covering up? I started covering up. I started like wearing like sweaters and hoodies because I didn't know that the Most High was probably trying to tell me how to cover up. I just knew he wanted my body covered. He didn't want people to just be able to see me like nude or anything. So I was just wearing all these big clothes and just covering my body. And they would just basically try to tell me I shouldn't cover my body. I need to come back to the club. I'm boring now. Do I want some more weed? Cause I stopped smoking weed. It was like all the things he was taking me from, they had gave it back to me or was trying to give it back to me. And at the time I was talking to, I had started talking to my husband and he was encouraging me to keep up with the things that the Most High was telling me to keep up with. But I had them fighting me and before I started talking to him, they were just trying to bring me down and bring me low. So then after that, after meeting my, uh, talking to my husband again and getting higher and, and following the most high and, and doing all this stuff and, and finding my husband and falling in love and, and you know, cause the messenger of God, messengers and angels of God told me that my husband is my twin flame. I was happy. I was in love. We were talking all the time for hours on the phone. I would just stay in the park. I would just go to the beach just to be out of that house away from my mom and her girlfriend. And we were having a beautiful time, beautiful connection. And then shortly after that, I went back to the psych ward. I went back to the psych ward. Um, it was just like, I just couldn't get a break. Every time I tried to get happy or go forth, something else would happen to me. Went back to the psych ward. At the time, my husband had knew that I had bipolar and stuff, but I don't think I mentioned schizophrenia or mentioned exactly in detail everything that I had or what was going on. So to him, I just disappeared. I was just gone, you know, because in the hospital, I didn't memorize his number yet, so I couldn't call him. And it isn't like my mother gave me his number or anything. So I was gone for like, I don't know if it was this time, it was like three days or something, but I was gone and he couldn't find me or anything. So... He did, when I got out of the hospital, he did understand. He did, because um, what it is, is I go through psychosis as well. I mean, I know what psychosis is, but when you have schizophrenia and bipolar, you can go through psychosis. I think you can go through psychosis without having those, but I have those. So, I went back to the psych ward. So, that was in October, my third time back to the psych ward for psychosis, which is like delusions, hallucinations, me seeing things that aren't there, me hearing things that aren't there. Um... The ambulance picked me up outside of um, the guy that I was in that relationship with that was abusing me outside of his old house. The ambulance picked me up from there. Um, a lady had called on me. Um, she called on me, said that I was dancing, called on me, and I just kind of passed out. But it's not like I really passed out. I trained myself and had the relationship with him how to faint because if I would faint, he would stop beating me and choking me. So I guess I just fake fainted and the ambulance came and took me into the hospital. So that's what happened that time. And it was just like me and my husband was trying to connect and grow further on love and the enemies, the devil seemed like he placed it back into my mind of that abusive relationship again and trying to confuse my brain and confuse me. And then that, what happened to me and when I also was in that lifestyle um I had got like I had I used to have 14 piercings um I had my nose my septum lip lip I had like ears the industrial ears um and then when I was in that lifestyle but before that I got um down there peers I got up here peers so I have no more piercings and you know God has delivered me from all those things um, I do have tattoos but I didn't get any more tattoos once I found out that they were not of God um, let me see. and when I was 
writing this down, um, all this stuff that happened to me in this year, because after I got out of the psych ward, I continued on that relationship with my husband, building it, growing, and then two months after that, um, the Most High made it a way that I was able to travel to, to Chicago and go live there and um, be with my husband. So what I wrote down, it says, I keep hearing all before your breakthrough. They tried to stop, stop you. Satan wanted to stop you. And those were his last attempts and he failed. So all those things that I spoke about in this video that I went through was before, um, before my husband and I like coming together and moving forward with my life and all these things that I've been through. So for those who are watching all of my the testimony series, it's not done yet because um, even after my husband and I got together, we had we had to have a lot of trials and tribulations that we continue to go through with the devil trying to fight us and trying to break our union and come between us. So it's not done. I just had to put this video in because this is kind of like uh, in between video number eight and I had to explain it in depth so there will be over time that um, I'll be having other videos explaining things in depth but I feel led to tell you guys that when I was in the life of prostitution I felt horrible and I numbed myself during those intercourses and I kind of tried to black out or dissociate um, which I have dissociation identity disorder and take myself out of it and it's like put myself on the ceiling like I'm not there or I'm not in my body trying to remove myself out to do these things kind of like what I do when I went through rapes and stuff took myself out of my body and it doesn't mean that the trauma and the pain and the things that I'm going through is not there it just means that I temporarily did that and now I have to continue to work on the healing process to get those things out of me um being in that lifestyle, like I said, was scary. I felt disgusted. I felt sick. I felt gross. I felt worse about myself. I didn't feel better. And I felt low. My self-esteem was even lowered. I wanted to commit suicide. I didn't want to live. It's not a lifestyle that anybody should try to get into. Try to get out if you're in it. You should get out. And it's nothing to glorify. All that money, all that stuff is just temporary. It's not worth your soul. It's not worth your life. And I just thank God for pulling me out of that lifestyle, pulling me out of all the things that I was in. And I just thank him so very much. And I had been waiting, waiting for, you know, my case for the terroristic threat. I was waiting to go to court and I was calling all the time to see what my court date was. And I mean, God truly had his hand on me because when I called before I went to Chicago, I called like in November or December before I went to Chicago and the case was dismissed. They just threw the case out and that was a felony. I was to do jail time and they threw the case out. So I know that God had his hand on me, even in the midst of all my mess. He was there for me. He knew who I was. He knew that I would turn around. He knew that's not the life that I wanted. And he was going to make sure that I was protected and to protect me from a felony. Because he understood that when I said those words, that I was going to kill that lady. He knew I didn't mean that. He knew that I was out of anger and rage. And he understood the pain I was feeling for my brother's things being stolen, as well as everything that I owned, except for a small percentage that I left at my wife's. So... I pray that someone can learn from this or that it can help somebody. And I just want to say thank you for listening. Um, God be with you all. And yeah, bless. Some people have seen where God has brought you from. They don't really understand it. They don't know your story. Not imagine, not imagine the pain, the trial, the pain, the trials I've had to get. You don't know, you don't know my story. You don't know the day he said.